Father, uh, the other day, Professor Lopez Rosario also discussed contracts with you, Muka. Although, hindi niya dapat covered ang contracts, di ba? Wala akong magagawa po. <laughs> ang aking trabaho ay mag-discuss ng contracts, sabi ni Dean. So, I have to discuss contracts with you, okay? But, uh, well, una, by the time I finish contracts with you, dapat experts na kayo ng contracts, okay? And pangalawa, I have always maintained this uh, position that uh, if you know by heart the general principles in obligations and contracts, it will be much easier for you to understand the special contracts, okay? In fact, you can answer questions involving special contracts again by citing the principles in Oblicon, okay? So, ganun ka-importante ang Oblicon. Uh, so, uh, I will have to proceed uh, <laughs> with uh, the discussion on contracts. Although, um, although, as I was also asked to discuss the special contracts, okay, uh, starting with sales, I may just have to uh, emphasize on the special contracts alang siguro, okay? As in, uh, uh, Professor Lopez Rosario even discussed yung mga voidable, unenforceable contracts. Diniscuss din niya. Anyway, okay? So, uh, allow me, nonetheless, okay? To continue. Trabaho lang. <laughs> um... In uh, answering questions involving contracts, okay, you may be able to answer these questions by knowing the nature of the contract, the type of contract involved. Okay, um, let's uh, consider this case decided by the Supreme Court. Okay, uh, A borrowed a sum of money from a bank. Okay. And uh, to secure the fulfillment of uh, his obligations to the bank, actually several, several uh, transactions ito, several loans. He uh, mortgaged his crops, okay? Kaya ang tawag doon sa loan ay crop loans. Now, thereafter, before the obligations became due, all the crops were destroyed due to a for two weeks event, okay? When the uh, debts became due, the bank demanded payment, but uh, the debtor claimed that his obligation to pay was extinguished by the loss of the crops. Is he correct? Clearly, the answer is no, okay? The problem requires you to, de to determine what contracts first were entered into, di ba? Una, anong mga kontrata? If you don't know what contracts were entered into, of course, you cannot answer the question. First, the first contract obviously pertains to a loan, okay? And the second contract, to secure the fulfillment of his obligation under the contract of loan, appears to be a chattel mortgage. Now, the subject matter of the chattel mortgage were the crops. So when the crops were destroyed, did that result in the extinguishment of his obligation under the loan contract? Obviously, the answer is no, because a chattel mortgage is only an accessory contract. And therefore, even if the accessory contract is extinguished, that will not extinguish the principal contract because the accessory only follows the principal, not the principal which follows the accessory. So, even if the crops were destroyed due to a fortuitous event, at best, it only extinguished the chattel mortgage. Being an accessory contract, the extinguishment of the accessory contract 
does not at all affect the obligations under the principal contract. The only net effect of that is the obligation under the loan contract will now be unsecured. Yeah? It would have been a totally different scenario if the principal contract, the loan contract, was the one which was extinguished. By operation of law, the accessory contracts would likewise be extinguished. The accessory, again, would follow the principal. This uh, is the case of Republic versus Grijaldo. Thus, which contracts are considered as the principal, which contracts are considered as the accessory contracts, okay? Principal contracts, again, are contracts which can stand on their own, okay? Accessory contracts depend on other contracts for their existence or for their validity, okay? I would enjoin you all to try to memorize only the accessory contracts, because if you know the accessory contracts, you can presume all other contracts to be principal contracts, okay? They, all the others can stand on their own. And what are these accessory contracts? These are the contracts which you have studied in credit transactions. These are all security arrangements, okay? Starting from guarantee, surety ship, pledge, shuttle mortgage, real estate mortgage, and anti-crisis, okay? But of course, we will have so much time discussing these special contracts or security arrangements, okay? So, yun ang accessory contracts, das tanungin kayo, pledge, it's a principal contract. Deposit, it is a principal contract. But one common problem would pertain to how about preparatory contracts? Are they principal contracts or are they accessory contracts? Principal contracts are those which are not uh, the end by themselves. They are entered into for other contracts to be entered into. Okay? Uh, the most common preparatory contract probably is agency. Okay? Together with uh, partnership, of course, which is also a preparatory contract. Now, if the agent, for example, did not enter into other contracts, as he bound himself to do so. Uh, example, he was, uh, this is an agency to sell, but he did not sell anything, any of the goods of the principal. Would that affect the validity of the contract of agency? The answer is no. Okay? Preparatory contracts can stand on their own. Okay? Even if they are not the end by themselves, they can stand on their own. They are not accessory contracts. In fact, if he failed to comply with his obligations under that contract, as a rule, he can be held liable for not performing his obligation. Okay? Now, uh, but consider this uh, scenario. Okay? Um, again, A borrowed money from B. Now, to secure the fulfillment of his obligation, A agreed to deliver his watch to B as a security, okay, in a verbal agreement. Uh, without this watch being delivered to B, uh, was there a perfected contract involved in the problem? Well, uh, and before the delivery also of the sum of money borrowed, okay, was there a perfected contract? What contracts again are involved in the problem. Una, loan, which is a specifically mutuum, a borrowed money from B. The second contract appears to be a pledge. Now, before the delivery of the money by the lender to the borrower, and before the borrower delivered the watch to the lender as a security, was there a perfected contract? The answer is none, okay? Both contracts involved are known as real contracts. For the perfection of these contracts, delivery of the object or subject matter of the contract is required. Actually, the law and this, the uh, 1316, okay, enumerates real contracts. Though there are only three enumerated real contracts under Article 1316, which are pledge, deposit, and commodatum, 
Clearly, Motuum is also a real contract as expressly provided under the law on uh, simple loans. This contract will only be perfected upon the delivery of the money or the thing borrowed to the borrower. Okay? Now, uh, a question sa bar exam can be as objective as was there a perfected contract. Okay? So, for example, in this, uh, the question can even be more objective as distinguish consensual from real contracts and name at least four kinds of real contracts under the present law. Of course, consensual contracts are contracts which are perfected by mere consent. Or, better yet, I would actually, uh, I encourage instead uh, uh, that you uh, state uh, this contract is perfected upon the meeting of the minds as to the object and the consideration. Why? Because just stating that this is perfected by mere consent, what is meant by consent? But uh, if, if you stated that this, there is a meeting of the minds as to the object and the consideration, ay wala nang iba, di ba? Uh, because it is possible that can there be a meeting of the minds as to the object, but there was no meeting of the minds as to the consideration, yes. And there would be no perfected contract in that scenario, okay? But nonetheless, uh, I, I suppose an answer that consensual contracts are perfected by mere consent should also be equally correct, okay? However, real contracts, as mentioned already a while ago, are contracts which are perfected only upon the delivery of the object or subject matter of the contract, okay? And while uh, the examiner required at least four, as if there are more than four real contracts, I already mentioned the real contracts. Here, as to whether the contract is consensual or real, uh, I would again recommend that you ch just to memorize yung real contracts. Because all the other contracts, you can presume, okay? Medyo confident ka na they are consensual because they are not real contracts. Actually, with an exception, I would accept uh, as a better classification of contracts in relation to perfection that there is a third classification, which are formal or solemn contracts. Because these contracts are not perfected by mere consent. These contracts are not even perfected upon the delivery. Because the law further requires that a certain form, a certain form be executed in order for this contract to be valid. But if a contract is not valid, may it be perfected? Of course not. Okay? Uh, no obligation would even arise from such contract if it is a void contract. Uh, a good example here, as uh, I would have time sa forms, is anticresis. Okay? The law requires that the agreement as to the principal and interest shall be in writing, otherwise the antichrist is void. Okay? Of course, a common example of authors would pertain to a donation. Although, strictly speaking, I would always emphasize that under the civil code, a donation, strictly speaking, is not a contract. Okay? It is not classified even as a special contract. It is merely an act okay? under the civil code. Although... Professor Tolentino would even have the position that the code should have categorized this as a special contract because anyway, consent is also required as to both parties. In fact, under the law on donations, if the donation involves an immovable property, it has to be in a public instrument. Otherwise, the donation is void. Uh, of course, the law provides that if the donation is onerous in character, it shall be governed by the law on contracts. Okay? Now, uh, so consensual, real, and formal contracts in relation to perfection. This one. Merle offered to sell her automobile to Violi for 60000 After inspecting the automobile, Violi offered to buy it for 50000 This offer was accepted by Merle. The next day, Merle offered to deliver the automobile, but Violi, being short of funds, secured postponement of the delivery, promising to pay the price upon arrival of the steamer Helena. The steamer, however, never arrived because it was wrecked by a typhoon and sunk somewhere off the coast of Samar. Is there a perfected contract in this case? Why? Again, before you can 
correctly answer the question as to whether the contract was perfected, the first thing that you should be considered is what contract was entered into. Okay? Uh, but the facts are very clear that this is a contract of sale. And if you know that a contract of sale is a consensual contract, then your answer should be yes. There was a perfected contract of sale in this case. When was the contract perfected? When, Violi, uh, when Merle offered to Violi the 60000 was there a perfected contract? None because the 60000 was not accepted. In fact, a counteroffer was made. It was at that time of the acceptance of the counteroffer that the contract was perfected. Okay? Although there could be a problem here, was the contract perfected considering the fact that uh, uh, the buyer promised to pay the price upon the arrival of the steamer Helena? And the steamer never arrived. In other words, a condition did not happen. Nonetheless, was the contract perfected? The answer still is yes. The condition here is not the type of condition which you must have discussed in obligations. Whether the condition is suspensive, resolutory, because if the condition there in conditional obligations is suspensive, the obligation would arise only upon the happening of the condition. If the condition did not happen, the obligation will not even arise. But here, the condition arrival of the steamer is not for the obligation to arise because the contract had already been perfected. There were already obligations. The condition here is for the condition as to the fulfillment of the obligation. This is not a condition for the obligation to arise, kundi kung kailan. Ang kailan presupposes that there is already an obligation. Okay? Uh, hindi tinanong dito what are the consequences of the non-happening of the condition as to the payment of the price. But we will discuss that when we discuss sales. Okay? Uh, the specific consequence of the fact that the condition as to the payment did not happen. Okay? In the meantime, ang tanong lang naman, is there a perfected contract? Again, in exams, especially sa bar exam, do not at all answer a question which is not asked. Okay? Kung ano lang ang tanong, yun lang ang sagutin. Huwag masyado magpa-impress. Okay? Hindi natutuwa ang mga examiner sa sobra-sobrang sagot. Okay? Ang isang pinaka-reason dyan, ang dami na kasing kanilang binabasa. Diba? Libu-libong mga notebooks na ang binabasa. So they don't want to read any unnecessary statement as brief as possible. Okay? Now, uh, although may mga problems, I would admit, would really require qualifications. You have to lay down the premises, etc., before you can give the final conclusion. Iba naman yun, okay? Now, uh, so, as to perfection or extinguishment, again, consensual, real, and formal. Now, there are other classifications of contracts, okay? Not, may not be favorite uh, so far sa bar exam, but uh, there's always a first, okay? Um, normally, there would be no question because the problem would be a very long problem. Kaya walang ganong tanong. Example, in a problem involving a contract where a thing was delivered, okay? What contract was entered into? In other words, what will be the rights and obligations of the parties under that contract? The answer, of course, will depend on the intention of the parties as to the effect of the delivery. Would the delivery result in transfer of ownership? Or was the purpose of the delivery only for the use and enjoyment of the thing by the other party? Or was the delivery only for the purpose of safekeeping? Depending sa purpose ang nature ng contract. Okay? If it is for the transfer of ownership, what contract was entered into? Probably 
that contract or transaction, if it is not a contract, if it is a contract, it could be a sale. It could be barter. But it cannot be a lease. It cannot be, it cannot be a commodatum, di ba? Because there is transfer of ownership. If this is merely a transaction, this could be the son in pago. There is transfer of ownership. But if there is no transfer of ownership and uh, the purpose is for the use and enjoyment of the thing by the other party to whom the thing was delivered, what contract was entered into? Aba, this could be a lease this time. Or this could be a commodatum. The big difference this time goes into the nature of the contract as to the cost. Because if there is a price to be paid for the use or enjoyment of the thing, that would be a lease. But if the use or enjoyment is... Uh, gratuitous, walang babayaran, this could be commodatum. Okay? So, again, you should know the kind of contract involved in relation to the purpose and sometimes in relation to the consideration. Okay? Uh, kung service, okay? Uh, ang purpose is the rendition of service. Clearly, this could be a contract of agency, but this could also be a contract of lease of service. Okay? Uh, when we discuss lease in relation to agency, uh, we will discuss the distinctions between the two. For example, concretely, uh, in an agreement where one of the parties binds himself to render service to another, that would only be a lease of service if there is no principal agent relationship existing between the parties that is required by law. Okay? Pero parehong service ang kanilang subject matter. Diba? Now, uh, on the other hand, okay? as to who would be obligated under a contract, okay? if uh, both parties would be obligated, in other words, reciprocal obligations would arise, this contract is considered as a bilateral contract. Whereas if only one would be obligated, this is a unilateral contract. Of course, one author would erroneously claim that a contract thou is bilateral because there are two parties to this contract. This is fundamentally wrong because the implication of that statement is in unilateral contracts, there is only one party. But can there be a contract with only one party? Of course. Wala, di ba? May nagpa-party ba na mag-isa siya? Siyempre, wala. Pag-party... Marami. Maraming tao. <laughs> Dalawang involved at least. Okay? Kaya, uh, a contract is bilateral or unilateral not because of the number of parties. There should be at least two parties, but rather as to who will be obligated. Where lies the relevance of this classification? Well, uh, if it is bilateral, then clearly both of them would have obligations. But there are certain principles or concepts which may be applicable, uh, which where certain rules may or may not be applicable. Example, if you remember 1191, which should have been discussed in obligations, uh, recession is only implied by law in reciprocal obligations. In other words, recession would be implied only in contracts known as bilateral contracts. If the oblig if the if the contract is a unilateral contract, obviously recession is not implied as a remedy in this contract, despite breach. Okay? Now, um, as to the cause I mentioned already, uh, you may have to know whether the contract is under the law. The law itself classifies contracts as to cause, whether the contract is onerous, the law would call the other contract as a contract of pure beneficence, although most commonly known as gratuitous. Okay? Uh, of course, uh, others would call this also as lucrative contracts. And finally, there's a third kind of contract as to cost, which is remuneratory. Okay? Consider this uh, scenario. If A and B had an agreement, that A will render service to B. And upon the completion of the service, B will have to pay a certain amount to A. What kind of contract has to cost? Is this a remuneratory contract because there is service involved? 
The answer is no. Okay? In remuneratory contracts, this pertains to remuneration of service which had already been rendered past service. Okay? Under the facts, A obliges himself to render service. This is exactly covered by onerous contracts. Okay? In onerous contracts, the cause, as far as each contracting party, is the prestation or promise to give or render service to the other party. Okay? Kaya, um, dito, uh, one obliges himself to render service Ang kanyang cost is the payment of the price. As to the other party who would pay the price, ang cost niya is the promise of the other to render service. Okay? In fact, contract of sale. What, uh, what is the cost in a contract of sale? A common, not really accurate answer is the price. Sasabihin, ang cost sa sale ay the price. The Supreme Court would not agree with you on that. Okay? Because in a contract of sale, the Supreme Court would tell us, as to the seller, the cost is the payment of the price. But as to the buyer, the cost is the delivery and transfer of ownership. Is this a good interpretation? Yes, because a sale is... Uh, an onerous contract and therefore the cost being in an onerous contract is the promise or prestation to be performed by the other party okay now uh, why would we care if this is uh, onerous or gratuitous well aside from the fact that uh, in in gratuitous contract the cost is mere liberality of uh, one of the parties in other words uh, if uh, Liberality lang, eh di wala siyang receive from the other party. Di ba? Thank you lang. Okay? Hopefully may thank you. Okay? Now, uh, but there are also principles which can only be invoked if the contract is onerous in the same manner that there are principles which can only be invoked if the contract is gratuitous. Okay? A good example, when we go into interpretation of contracts, when would the, the least transmission of rights be applicable? Pag, gratuitous. But if the contract is onerous, you should apply the greatest reciprocity of interest. Diva. So you should know the nature of the contract, whether it is onerous or gratuitous. Okay? In agency, that would also be relevant as we discuss that contract. Um, in a few days, okay? Now, uh, what else? Um, as to uh, whether there is equivalence in the value of the prestations to be performed by both parties, the con contracts are classified into commutative and aleatory. Others would say that this classification also pertains to the risk of fulfillment. Okay? Okay lang yon, pareho lang yon. Okay? If there is equivalence in the value of the prestations, commutative yan. Okay? And the classic commutative contract is a sale. Classic, I would say. Why? Ordinarily, would a seller sell his property for a price less than its value? Ordinarily, no. And would a buyer buy a thing at a price higher than value? No. So ordinarily, there will be equivalence in the value of the prestations. Okay? Kaya, a sale is a commutative contract. However, may a contract of sale be aleatory in character? Okay? The answer is yes. Okay? The law on sales expressly recognizes a kind of sale which is an aleatory contract. This is called by law a sale of hope. Okay? Pag sa mga bumibili ng mga lotto ticket, yan ay an aleatory contract of sale. Okay? Now, uh, here, there is no equivalence in the value of the prestations because you only have to pay 10, 10 pesos or maybe 20. Yung iba alam na alam kung alin ang 10, alin ang 20. Yung mga su super lotto, mga 20 yan, mga ganun yata. Yung MWF 20, yung TTH 10, mga ganyan ang alam nila. Okay? Now, uh, uh, there's no 
uh, equivalence because you only pay 20, but you may actually win 200 million pesos. You may win, but more often than not, you will not win. Okay? Kaya siya aleatory. In other words, there is the, the, the performance of the obligation of one of the parties is dependent upon the happening of a certain condition. And the condition is an event which may or may not happen. Ang condition dito sa sale of a lotto ticket is that the number which you chose will be the numbers that will uh, be drawn. Okay? Out of the six, swerte ka na kung makaisa ka. Diba? Kaya, aleatory contract. Now, uh, this is a valid contract. Therefore, you cannot demand for reimbursement of the amount you paid dahil lang walang nag-appear ni isang number. Okay? Mga dalawang beses na actually ako tumaya dyan sa loto, sa buong buhay ko. Okay? Once with my office mates, yung mga senior officers ng company, agreed to bet sa system betting. Alam niyo yung system betting. Parang you can choose like nine numbers. Dapat six lang mag-appear, di ba? Nine numbers ang pipiliin. Uh, kaya lang you have to pay so much. Ganun, kasi nine ang pinili mo. Maski i-rumble yun. Yung permutation as to the nine. Uh, we have to pay ang dami namin. More than ten kami. But we have to pay each mga 350 pesos each for that uh, permutation. Okay? Sa awa ng Diyos, I think ni isa doon sa Siam, walang lumabas. Okay? The next time I agreed to, uh, to bet with a friend, one of my good friends, sabi niya, pag umabot na ng 100 million, taya tayo. Di ba? So nang nag 1 million na, ba nagkasundo kami mag-jogging and then we bought also a ticket. Wala din nangyari. Okay? Kaya hindi na ako bumibili ng ticket. Isa ko pang weakness dyan, even sa sweepstakes, lalo na kung may mga medyo, medyo parang uh, physically handicap, medyo magpapabili sa'yo, bibilhin naman. Pero ang siste, hindi ko na naalala kung uh, nanalo yung number or hindi. Di ba? Wala lang. Hindi ko na alam ang nanalo pala ako. Okay? So, dapat pag bumili ka ng ticket, na, dapat nasa wallet mo at araw-araw mong titingnan kung nanalo or hindi. Okay? Again, uh, aleatory contracts. Well, the most, uh, 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 a classic aleatory contract, I would say, is an insurance contract. Kaya nga din Sun Diang would say, ito talaga ang lutong lugaw diba? na negosyo. Uh, talagang racket ang negosyo na ito. Well, pag hindi ka natsambahan, di ba? Uh, pag hindi natsambahan ang insurance company. So, into uh, other classifications, okay? Uh, some contracts are considered as nominate, others are innominate contracts, okay? What is the relevance of this classification? First of, first of course is, sabi nila is, because pag nominate, there is a name, okay? Pag inominate, walang name. But much more than that, the relevance goes into the governing law or what will govern the rights and obligations. As to these two kinds of contracts, as to what will primarily govern, pareho lang. What will primarily govern will be their stipulations. Again, consistent with the autonomy of contracts principle. Pero after that, ay magkaiba na. Okay? Because in nominate contracts, what will govern after their stipulations would be the provisions of the law regarding that contract. If this is a sale, then the, the provisions on sale. If this is a lease, then the provisions on lease. But if this is an innominate contract after the stipulations, or if the stipulations are not sufficient to resolve a controversy, what will govern the rights and obligations? The answer is 
the general principles in obligations and contracts. Kaya ganun, ka-importante ang general principles ng mga ito. Okay? But if the general principles in obligation are still not sufficient, hindi pa rin ma-resolve ang problema, what then should govern? The answer is, the provisions of the contract, which is the most analogous contract to that entered into by the parties. Okay? Halimbawa, a good example is the, the contract entered into by the parties was called joint venture agreement. As such, if the stipulations would not suffice, if the provisions in Oblicon also would not be sufficient, what rules, what provisions shall apply? It will be the provisions of partnership because the partnership contract is the most analogous contract as far as joint venture agreements are concerned. Okay? Now, uh, of course, pag wala talaga, you go into the customs. Okay? Uh, of course, it is said in the order yan as provided by law, hindi bara-bara. Okay? So, unang stipulations, pangalawa ang general principles of Likon, pangatlo ang uh, provisions as to uh, an, the most analogous contract and last ang um, customs. Okay? Then, uh, one other thing uh, would pertain to the subject matter. A classification of contracts as the subject matter. What may be the subject matter of uh, a contract? Uh, it, the contract may pertain to a thing, a right, or service. Okay? First, all contracts would have all the three subject matters? The answer is no. Okay? There are certain contracts na ang subject matter lang nila ay things and rights. Example, sale. Walang sale of service. Okay? Hindi binibili ang serbisyo. Sabi nila, nirerentahan lang. In English, lease of service. Okay? Now, uh, in the same manner, agency, what is the subject matter? Hindi thing. It is service. Uh, the rendition of the service is the subject matter. Okay? So again, if you know the subject matter of the contract, more or less, alam mo ang nature ng contract. Dahil kung uh, ang subject matter ay thing or right, ay hindi mo sasabihing list of service. Although a list of service may involve a thing as much as an agency may involve a thing because the agent may be required to sell a thing but it is the rendering of service it is the selling of the thing which is the subject matter okay um, then uh, in contracts even in sales for example you may have to distinguish whether the subject matter of the sale is a thing or a right okay a good uh, uh, example of a concept requiring this uh, distinction or determination would pertain to delivery. Okay? As we discuss uh, contracts of sale or the law on sales, there are different modes of delivery in sale of rights, kaysa sa sale of things. This is, of course, a recognition of the fact that rights are incorporeal they are intangible kaya you cannot physically deliver rights okay thus the law would provide for specific modes in delivery of rights in sale of rights okay uh, which we will discuss again under the law on sales then of course probably the most important classification would go into the status okay of the contract others would say uh the uh, whether the contract is valid and binding or whether it is defective, okay? Because authors would include void contracts as defective contracts, okay? But I beg to disagree, okay? As we go into the kinds of contracts as to the uh, classification as to status, okay? Uh, a better cl classification is contracts may be valid and binding, it may be defective, or it may be void, okay? Now, uh, uh, in, in a lot of problems, the question would be, is the contract valid and binding? Ganon palagi ang tanong. May the contract be enforced? Okay? So it goes into the validity, the, the binding effect of such contract. I, is, <coughs> we'll, we'll discuss these contracts <coughs> one by one.
Um, of course, yung mga defective, resistible, voidable, and unenforceable. Then, uh, into stages okay, of contracts. <coughs> if not all, almost all authors would uh, <coughs> only consider three stages. Negotiation, perfection, and consummation stage. De Leon would uh, define consummation stage to be that stage where uh, each contracting party had already performed their, his obligation. Okay? If that is the definition of consummation, uh, would you actually be able to say that after the perfection of the contract, it is thereafter terminated? Mukhang hindi. Okay? Uh, why there are cases sa Supreme Court is because precisely one or both parties did not comply with his obligation. Okay? Uh, kaya nagkakasuhan sila. In other words, upon perfection, ay walang automatic termination. In fact, uh, I dare to say with this definition of termination, there is a much more important stage recognized expressly by the law, which is the performance stage. From the perfection, it goes through performance before there can be termination. So many concepts may or may not be applicable depending on whether there is already a performance of certain obligations. A good, very good example, somebody sent me a text message uh, what is the meaning of uh, the statement that the statute of frauds is only applicable uh, as to executory contracts? Diba? Simply, the answer is, uh, if the contract had already been partially performed, that will take the contract out of the operation of the statute of frauds. In other words, uh, the law recognizes this stage, the performance stage, which would have certain effects. Even another concept, substantial performance as a concept. If there was substantial performance, which you must have studied in Oblicon 1231, no, uh, 1234, okay, uh, would recession still be a remedy? The answer is no, if there was already substantial performance. Substantial performance obviously presupposes there was performance, but there was no termination of the contract. But recession would not be a remedy. Okay? At any rate, uh, Justice Vito, for example, would define this stage, the consummation stage, uh, to start from the performance stage. Kung ganun ang definition mo ng consummation stage, mukhang wala ng performance. Kasi kasama na ang performance. Although mukhang hindi magandang definition, why would consummation start with performance? Diba? That is, in a way, De Leon's definition is correct. Pag consummated, may pagka consumatum est. Diba? Tapos na. Terminated na. Uh, but uh, if there is merely performance, maybe that's just the beginning. But that, that's not really the termination stage or consummation stage. At any rate, uh, if there will be a question, I'm sure there will be no such question, that uh, enumerate three stages, by all means, only uh, enumerate negotiation, perfection, and consummation. That would be a safe answer. Okay? Into these stages, negotiation. Negotiation is, is initiated by an offer. There has to be an offer. Okay? Others would call this policitation, okay? Uh, without an offer, ay walang negosasyon, walang offer. Eh. No one is offering to sell or offering to buy, offering to have his uh, car repaired, etc. Okay? Uh, this is also known as the preparation stage, conception stage, generation stage. Um, now, a question here would pertain to uh, one. May there be a perfected contract under this stage? The answer is yes, okay? That contract is known as an option contract, okay? So at this stage, uh, I, what is perfected there is not the 
uh, contract, which is the main contract. What is perfected is merely the option contract. This would definitely uh, arise if uh, there is an offer and the offeree, if there is an offer, the parties there are called offeree and offerer, okay? Uh, if there is an offer to sell, you don't call the parties buyer-seller because there is no perfected sale yet, okay? But there is merely an offer, so you call them the offerer and the offeree. Now, if, uh, if the offeree is not in a position to decide, okay, at that moment, and he asked for a period within which to decide, or the offerer himself gave him a period within which to decide, then there is an option agreement, okay? Is this an option contract? It depends, okay? If there is a consideration paid for that option period, separate and distinct from the price, that agreement can be called an option contract. Do not call that agreement as a contract if there was no such consideration, which is separate and distinct from the price, if this is an offer to sell, uh, which is something paid or promised. Take note that consideration need not have been paid even if there was only a promise to pay that is already a sufficient consideration. But a common misconception dito at this point is that a consideration for this contract, option contract, is known as option money. That is not necessarily so. The Supreme Court would tell us it need not be money. Okay? It may be any other prestation that uh, was promised to be performed. Okay? Kung sabi ng offeree, bigyan mo ako ng 20 days, I will paint your house three times over. Okay? That would be a sufficient consideration. Hindi naman pera ang ibibigay niya, pero there was a consideration separate and distinct from the price. Of course, I would agree that the most common consideration in an option contract is known as option money. Kasi pera. Okay? But, ano ang rights and obligations ng parties okay? in relation to this option agreement or option contract? Okay? Ito yung isang... Uh, take note that this, this discussion of, uh, in relation to options okay? is not only applicable to sales, okay? But there will be special rules on sales which we will discuss under the law on sales. But this discussion would also apply even to other contracts like an offer to construct a house, okay? Which may pertain to a contract for a piece of work, which was the subject matter of this bar exam question. No. Uh, sinimulan ko na dito. Um, this is the last. Uh, bar exam question in relation to this contract okay? or option agreement. So, probably pwedeng magkaroon na ng isang tanong uli. Marvin offered to construct the house of Carlos for a very reasonable price of 900,000, giving the latter 10 days within which to accept or reject the offer. On the fifth day, before Carlos could make up his mind, Marvin withdrew his offer. What is the effect of the withdrawal of Marvin's offer? Okay? Because the withdrawal was done before the offer he could communicate his acceptance. And as to the problem in letter A, there appears to be no consideration paid or promised in relation to the option. The withdrawal was a valid withdrawal. Okay? The law provides that if there is no such consideration, uh, which is separate and distinct from the price, the offerer can withdraw the offer at any time. And therefore, there can no longer be a perfected contract. Okay? Second question, will your answer be the same if Car Carlos paid Marvin 10000 as consideration for that option? Of course, the answer will no longer be the same. Because... If there was such a consideration, separate and distinct from the price, and the offer was withdrawn, that is a breach of contract, which is the option contract, which can be the basis of action for damages. Okay? 
Now, suppose in that Carlos accepted the offer before Marvin could communicate his withdrawal thereof, discuss the legal consequences. If Carlos accepted the offer before the offer could be withdrawn or before there was a communication or conveyance of the withdrawal, there would be a perfected contract. Does it mean, uh, does, this, does it matter if there was an, an option money or consideration? It doesn't matter, okay? The Supreme Court uh, discussed this in the case of Sanchez versus Rigos, that even if the option agreement was without a consideration, separate and distinct from the price, the fact that the offer was accepted before the offer could be withdrawn, there already uh, arises a perfected contract of sale because that was a sale, okay? Uh, again, upon the meeting of the minds, the contract was Perfected, okay? Uh, ang argument dito ni Mrs. Uh, Rigos was, since the option agreement had no consideration, separate and distinct from the price, then the option agreement is void. Because for a contract to be valid now, there has to be a consideration. Of course, the Supreme Court said that argument is erroneous because even if there is no such consideration, the fact remains that there was an offer. An offer does not require a consideration. As long as the offer is not withdrawn, it remains as an offer. And once it is accepted, there would be a perfected contract. Yeah? Now, um, um, uh, in relation to, the, to letter A, what is the effect of the withdrawal of uh, Marvin's offer? Even assuming, ah, in, in rela relation to the second, even assuming that there was an, a consideration uh, paid for that uh, option period and there was a withdrawal, okay, would an action for specific performance prosper? The answer is no. Because with the withdrawal of the offer before the conveyance of the acceptance, there was no more offer to be accepted there will be no more meeting of the minds as to the object and the consideration. So object meron pa siguro, but as to the, uh, in a way, there was no meeting of the minds as to the object and consideration. But since there was an, a consideration separate and distinct, and it, there was a withdrawal, this is a breach of the option contract. Ang tamang remedy ay hindi specific performance, kundi damages. A specific performance presupposes a perfected contract. Okay? Now, uh, in another bar exam question, Obaldo is the owner of a building which has been leased by Remejo for the past 20 years. Obaldo has repeatedly assured Remejo that if he should decide to sell the building, he will give Remejo the rest of first refusal. On June, 20, June 30, 94, Obaldo informed Remeo that he was willing to sell the building for $5 million. The following day, Remeo sent a letter to Obaldo offering to buy the building at $4.5 million. Obaldo did not reply. One week later, Remeo received a letter from Santos informing him that the building has been sold to him by Obaldo for $5 million and that he will not renew Remejo's lease when it expires. Remejo filed an action against Obaldo and Santos for cancellation of the sale, compel Obaldo to execute a deed of absolute sale in his favor based on his right of first refusal. If Ob uh, ang first question dito goes into the uh, right of first refusal, um, of course, uh, there was no proper uh, exercise of the right of first refusal because he was not willing to buy it at a price where a third person is willing to pay. Ang third person dito, 5 million, aba ang gusto lang bilhin niya ay 4.5. That is not uh, a proper exercise of the right of first refusal. Ang tamang exercise is if a third person is willing to buy it at 7 million, then he should also buy it at 7 million. In the same manner, if Ubaldo had been given Remeo an uh, option to purchase the building instead of a right of first refusal, will your answer be the same? The answer is yes. Because if the offer was to sell at 5 million, you have to buy it at 5 million, not at 4.5 or a price lower than the offer of uh, the owner of the building. Okay? Now, uh, thus, uh, uh, option, okay? Perfection, we have already discussed, uh, so we can proceed to 
um, elements, okay? Elements of contracts. Authors would uh, classify contracts in general, okay? Uh, the elements of contracts uh, in general as two essential, okay? Um, essential elements, natural elements, and accidental elements, okay? Uh, of course, we will focus on the essential elements, but uh, what are these elements known as natural elements? They are natural elements because they are deemed part of the contract by law, even if not agreed upon by the parties, even if not known to the parties, unless otherwise set aside by the parties. A good example of a natural element under the law on sales would be the implied warranties, okay? Maski hindi alam ng mga parties, ay, uh, these are considered part of the contract. Okay? Now, uh, for example, in a contract of loan, um, as to the obligation to pay interest, this would definitely be considered as an accidental element. Because the law requires for the lender to be entitled to interest that it must have been expressly stipulated, in fact, in writing. Uh, an element is accidental if uh, there would only be such element if it has been agreed upon by the parties, okay? Uh, such as interest in a contract of mutuum or simple loan, okay? So into the essential elements. Again, in contracts, the law considers three elements as essential. In other words, no contract would be valid without these three essential elements being present. Lahat ng tatlong ito. Okay? Uh, kailangan. In other words, if one of these essential elements is lacking, the contract is void. Okay? And these are... First, the consent of the contracting parties. Second, the subject matter, the object or subject matter of the contract. And the third is the cost or consideration. These are the essential elements of contracts in general. But if you are asked as to the essential elements of a specific contract, by all means, your answer should also be as specific. Because the object or subject matter of a sale is different from the object or subject matter of an agency. Diba? Or the object or subject or the cost of a contract of sale is different from the cost in commodatum. Okay? Uh, but as to these essential elements, I would not also uh, agree to uh, an answer that one of the essential elements is consent. Rather, it is the consent of the contracting parties. It is not sufficient that only one would give consent. The law requires the consent of the contracting parties. Because is it, is it possible that both contracting parties did not actually give consent? Ang pinakamadaling maalala or maintindihan ay in a contract where only one gave consent, the other did not. Because it is understandable that one of the contracting parties would be interested in the execution or the fulfillment of the contract. Diba? And this would normally, this, this contract obviously is called a fictitious contract. Okay? Uh, when one of the parties, only one gave consent, uh, this would be a fictitious contract. The most common scenario is because the signature of one of the parties was merely forged. Okay? And under 1409, fictitious contracts are void contracts. The reason behind this is because there is lack of one of the essential requisites as, pa as far as one of the contracting parties. But as I mentioned earlier, it is possible that both contracting parties did not give consent to a specific contract. They may even have signed, they may even have voluntarily affixed their signatures, but it doesn't mean that they actually intended to be bound to such contract. They did not intend to be bound, they did not in Gave, they did not give consent to that contract. Ang tawag ng contract na ito under the civil code is a simulated contract. Okay? Of course, the civil, civil code would uh, classify simulated contracts into two. 
absolutely simulated and relatively simulated. Absolutely simulated contracts, in absolutely simulated, the parties never intended to be bound to any contract. But they signed a deed. The most common deed which is simulated is a deed of sale. They would voluntarily affix their signature. They may even uh, voluntarily appear before a notary public, but they actually never intended to be bound okay, to any contract. The most common reason here, the most common purpose of simulation of a contract, which is an absolute simulation, is to defraud creditors. Okay? To make it appear that uh, one of the parties, which is normally a seller, doesn't have any property which may be reached by his creditors. Okay? Because even if the contract is a simulated contract, does it appear to be a valid and binding contract? Yes, it has all the appearance of a valid contract. Pwede ngang notarize, sabi ko. And therefore, the register of deeds, can he refuse to annotate uh, such contract doon sa uh, copy ng uh, uh, certificate of title or can he refuse to cancel the uh, TCT in the name of the seller and uh, refuse to uh, issue another uh, TCT? Hindi. Because it appears to be a valid and binding contract. Yung parties lang yung uh, they did not intend to be bound. Okay? Ang isang well, in a way, defraud. It, this is also to defraud third persons. Ang isang relatively common ngayon ay to make it appear opposite, to make it appear that the buyer has properties in his name. Common ito sa mga uh, Filipinos who would want to be permanent residents abroad because itong mga bansa uh, na iba, they will not accept you as resident kung wala kang pera o wala kang properties normally, di ba? Kasi nga naman, magiging pabigat ka lang sa kanila. So the more properties are registered in your name, ay, the greater the chance that your application will be approved. In fact, sa Canada, a few years ago, uh, my cousin who, uh, uh, who applied for residency in Canada was required to maintain an account, a dollar account which should have a minimum of uh, worth 200,000 pesos for a minimum of two years. Dapat i-maintain yung account. Di ba? Eh kung may 200,000 pesos ka, ba't ka pa magkakanada? Di ba? Eh di mag... Uh, kaya lang, 200 lang din. Minsan, 200, mauubos din in uh, two weeks. <laughs> kaya pwede na rin, di ba? 200,000 uh, otherwise, your application again would be disapproved. Okay, so absolutely simulated. But take note: a party to that contract may be bound to that contract as far as third persons who dealt with the property involved in such contract in good faith. This we will discuss in sale. A buyer in good faith who purchased the thing from an apparent owner is protected under the law. Okay, kaya. Yung owner, sorry na lang siya. He will be bound to that contract even if, as to the parties, it is a void contract. Okay? Now, uh, absolutely simulated, uh, relatively simulated, the parties actually intended or entered into a transaction. But instead of executing the document reflecting the real agreement, they will simulate a contract. Okay? The most common contract na si relatively simulated again is a sale. Why would they do this? Ordinarily, for tax evasion. Okay? I will not call this tax avoidance. Mas hindi ako tax lawyer. Okay? Because the purpose of this is to defraud the government. Kasi kung ang tunay na transaction is a donation, they would make it appear na sale. Okay? Because the tax liability in donations is definitely much higher kaysa sa sale. Di ba? Parang as high as, anong pinaka-highest percentage? 40? Hindi naman. Ha? Sa, sa donation. At any rate, kung capital gains tax lang yan, that's only 5%, plus documentary stamp tax, uh, additional 1.5%. Uh, 
1.5. So, medyo mas mali talaga. So, they would simulate a sale instead of executing a deed of donation. Okay? Now, um, what else? Well, another simulated sale na relatively simulated again uh, uh, yung purpose is not necessarily for tax purposes but to circumvent the provision uh, in succession involving collation okay because if it is a donation it is subject to collation well if the donors ordinarily the parents would want to give a specific property to a child, as in give, as in donation, uh, they would make it appear in a sale so that the other heirs would no longer have a right over the property. Diba? In other words, kung kapatid nyo ang uh, taong ito who would receive the property, siya ang paborito ng parents nyo. Diba? Hindi kayo ang paborito. Okay? Although, Pwede rin baliktad. Uh, why a parent would give a property to a specific child kasi pasaway ang child na ito. Di ba? Tipong tambay lang, wala talagang trabaho. Naawa lang ang parents, kaya binigyan ng house and lot. Okay? Para hindi naman maging palaboy. Okay? Uh, that's the only reason. But obviously, since this is a void contract, there is... Uh, there is uh, lack of uh, one of the essential requisites here uh, of actually walang consent to the sale ang consent nasa donation okay plus the cost is fictitious okay simulated ang cost okay um, it is easy for other parties to actually question the validity okay in one actual case it was merely proven that this uh, buyer allegedly buyer doesn't have any means of purchasing the property. Diba? Eh kung tambay lang talaga siya, ang nakalagay sa price ay 4 million, how could he pay the 4 million? Diba? Obviously, the sale was merely a simulated sale. Okay? Relatively simulated. Uh, again, uh, this is a void uh, contract. Okay? Now, uh, fictitious simula simulated. Okay? On the other hand, actually, I have uh, this uh, matrix, okay? I, uh, I was informed that others uh, would not be able to see uh, yung, uh, clearly, okay? But uh, I can state as, uh, verbally that, again, fictitious contracts are void. Simulated contracts, likewise, are void, okay? Although in relatively simulated contracts, the parties will be bound to the, con to the contract or transaction which they really intended to enter into. Okay? Uh, on the other hand, if consent was given, even if consent was given by both parties, that does not guarantee that the contract would be a valid and binding contract. Okay? The next thing that should be in your mind is who gave consent. Because a party to that contract who gave consent may be incapacitated or under the law, he cannot validly give consent. Ang tawag natin normally ay incapacitated person. Okay? But in relation to consent given by incapacitated person, okay, there are two kinds of incapacities. Okay? My absolute, my relative incapacity. Simply lang ang uh, distinction. Why absolute? Because this person having this absolute incapacity cannot validly give consent in any contract with anyone over anything. Absolute. Cannot validly give consent. Hindi ko naman sinabing cannot give consent, but cannot validly give consent. Okay? On the other hand, if uh, the incapacity is merely a relative incapacity, okay? Uh, this person actually is prohibited only from entering into a specific contract, maybe only a sale. But sometimes, even as to sale, hindi lahat ng sale, only in a particular capacity, like he is only prohibited as a buyer. Pero walang problema if he is the seller. Or he may be prohibited uh, 
as a buyer, but only over a specific thing, not everything. Hindi sapatos, hindi ano, but actually this appeared sa bar exam in relation to a sale of a parcel of land. Okay? Thus, ang tawag ay relative incapacity. Okay? Going back to absolute incapacity, okay? If the incapacity is absolute, Again, bear in mind that there are two kinds of capacity, even under the civil code, okay? One capacity is known as juridical capacity, also synony synonymously known as juridical personality. The other kind of capacity is the capacity to act. What is the difference? In juridical capacity, this is the fitness to be the subject of a legal relation. In other words, for example, a fetus. Can a fetus be the subject uh, of a legal relationship or a transaction? The answer is yes. In other words, all living, natural persons, basta buhay sila, maski baliw, they have juridical capacity. Okay? They have the fitness to be the subject of legal relation. As I said, even a fetus is given a juridical personality subject only to the requirements provided under Article 41, which you must have discussed already even in succession. Okay? Now, however, sino ang walang juridical capacity? Obviously, as to natural persons, those who are already dead because death extinguishes juridical capacity. Pero kung patay na siya, how can he be considered to have entered into a contract? E patay na siya, hindi na siya makapirma. Well, there is a possibility that his signature may have been affixed. How? Yung thumb mark niya. Maski patay na siya, aba, pwede pa, medyo ma-init-init pa ang kanyang thumb mark. Pwede pang i-affix sa deed of sale. But obviously, that sale is void because he doesn't have juridical capacity anymore. At that time, his thumb marks were affixed. Okay? In fact, in one case, even if the person was still alive when his signature was affixed, obviously by those persons interested in his parcels of land, anong status ng contract? There was fraud, clearly. Wala na, wala nang ulirat ang mama. He was about to die, almost 100 years old, okay? Uh, in fact, after the date of the contract, a few days thereafter, he died, okay? The fraud here, is this a kind of fraud which only vitiates consent and therefore the contract is merely voidable? Or is this a fraud which really goes into the essential requisite because there was fraud, this person actually did not give consent? Sabi ng Supreme Court, the fraud here uh, resulted in uh, lack of one of the essential requisites. He actually did not give consent. Not only was his consent not not only was his consent vitiated, hindi yon, okay? Rather, there was really no consent, void. The big difference, of course, in those two scenarios would pertain to prescription. Because pag voidable lang, the action for the annulment should be filed within four years. Pero pag void ay habang buhay, pwedeng i-declare null and void yan. Now, uh, so, absolute incapacity in relation to juridical capacity. In relation to juridical persons. When would a contract be void because one of the parties does not have juridical capacity? A common case uh, where the Supreme Court would uh, consider a contract void for lack of juridical capacity would pertain to one of the parties which is a corporation which has not been registered with the SEC. Okay? And therefore, that sale is void because one of the parties does not have juridical capacity. Okay? Now, into the capacity to act, okay? Uh, I, I, I uh, stated here without capacity to act because the law sometimes would use the term without. Sometimes the law would say lack of capacity to act. But I would rather prefer, which would sometimes be used also by the law, restrictions on one's capacity to act. Hindi naman totally wala. Hindi naman lack or without. But these are restrictions on one's capacity to act. Example, hindi walang wala kasi if a person is suffering civil interdiction, for example, nakakulong, wala na ba talaga siyang capacity? Meron pa naman, pwede nga siya mag-asawa eh, sa loob ng kulungan. Kaya lang, 
because there is such a restriction, his capacity to alienate his properties in Tervivos will be affected. Okay? Diba? Thus, ano itong mga restrictions on one's capacity to act? Ang pinaka-common ay minority and insanity. Okay? Subject, of course, to lucid interval, yung insanity. Now, uh, minority, take note, even if the law provides, ang nakalagay sa batas actually ay those who cannot give consent are unemancipated minors. Diba? Yun ang nakalagay. Hindi naman sinabi ng batas minors, but only unemancipated which means from that provision, there appears to be emancipated minors. Okay? But clearly, under the present law, there are no such creatures okay, na emancipated minors. Pwede yon before Republic Act 6809. Okay? Before, be before uh, 6809 reduced the age of majority to 18, a minor may be emancipated either by marriage or by concession of the parents okay uh, the the law here is not the family code with all due respect to those who would say that the family code reduced the age of majority to 18 hindi totoo yan when the family code took effect on august 3 1988 the age of majority under that code was 21 okay it was in 1989, December, that Republic Act 6809 took effect, where the age of majority was reduced to 18. In other words, under the family code, pwede pa ang emancipation by marriage because the marital age was 18 and the age of majority was 21. Okay? Now, uh, but ngayon, of course, wala na. Okay? Because once a person is 18, he has uh, the capacity to marry. Uh, under the family code as amended. Now, uh, but if only one of the contracting parties is incapacitated, only one of the parties was a minor at the time of the execution of the contract, take note the contract is voidable. Okay? Uh, this is one of the reasons why a contract would be voidable because of the incapacity of one of the parties. But if both parties are incapacitated, the contract is not merely voidable, the contract is unenforceable. Okay? So, parihong baliw ang pumasok sa kontrata, unenforceable ang kontrata. However, if one of them recovered from the insanity and ratified the contract, anong status ng contract? Balik sa voidable. Because then, only one of the parties would be incapacitated. Okay? Now, uh, in relative incapacity, Uwi na tayo, okay? <laughs> uh, marami kasing mga ano, incapacity sa relative incapacity, okay? I would want to discuss lahat-lahat, uh, including ibang contracts, hindi lang sa sale, okay? Under relative incapacity. <clears throat> uh, tomorrow, 8.30 tayo, ano? So, uh, hope to see you all at uh, 8.30 in the evening, okay? Good night.